Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the Portland State Transportation Seminar Series for Fall 2013. I'm pleased to introduce Michael Malk from DKS Associates, who will be our speaker today, and uh, we look forward to a great seminar. It's all yours, Mike. Thank you, Rob. Hello, and thank you for coming. Today I'd like to talk to you about a project that we did a uh, year or so ago. Actually, it was developing not just a project, it was developing a tool to enhance the output or the capabilities of a travel demand model. The Portland, let me get the clicker here, the Portland Metro Travel Demand Model. The presentation is basically going to be, we're going to do an introduction to the, the project, talk a little bit about the data that was used, the data sources, what we saw in the data, how we developed the model, a few details of the model, looking at the output, couple remarks, and time for questions. On the intro side, and why we engaged in this project, why we got started in the first place, was the Metro's travel demand model was set up such that they have the output volumes and speeds on the links in the system for a two-hour AM peak period a two-hour p.m. peak period, and a one-hour midday from noon to one. And those three time periods were the only output that the model produced. And from this, engineering and planning studies were being done looking at levels of congestion and doing needs analysis to rank projects and determine how can we use our money most wisely to keep the transportation system functioning as well as possible given limited budgets. And the people making the decision making found that the information that was provided were more limited than they wanted. And what I'm talking about is think of a peak hour level of service analysis. You have level of service A, B, C, D, E, F on a facility. Well, once a section of freeway hits level of service F during the PM peak hour, how bad is it really? And some of these links, some of these segments in the model, we're having a volume capacity ratio when you look at the demand versus the capacity of 1.5, 1.6. There was one and a half times the amount of demand for the services that that freeway system could provide at that point one and a half times the demand over what it could be accommodated. And when we looked at this and put it into operational analysis and did other analysis, you sat back and said, that's meaningless. What does it mean? What do we do with this information? And we had other segments where we are just above the level of service F threshold and segments where we are way over it. And in the output, it was all just level of service F. We needed something that gave us more information on measuring congestion when things got really bad. So what we looked, started looking at when we looked at other places and what was going on was what if we had an additional measure of service that not only told us level of service in the peak hour, but how many hours during the day were we going to be at level of service F? That level of service F in the PM, did it last for one hours or five hours? Both our LOSF but was it one hours of it being really bad or five or six hours of it being really bad? And this really matters when you're ranking transportation improvements for funding. Rather than just saying, oh, they're both LOSF, one's LOSF for eight or nine hours during the day, three hours in the morning and five hours at night, versus one's just one hour in the morning and one hour at night. It gives you a, another measure, a much better measure, for ranking projects and looking at the level of congestion when things are really bad and beyond what the system can handle. And that was largely driving the need for a project like this and for better performance measures coming out of the transportation planning models. And what we have here is we're just looking at the projected demand way above the capacity and looking at what can be done to bring that down or to get more meaningful measures other than just LOSF. If I'm smart enough to hang on to this, I can go forward. 
I think I got a little bit ahead in speaking of the slides. Um, some of the limitations of the current travel demand modeling is basically that they don't do well when you get very, very heavily congested conditions. And if we look ahead to 2030, 2035 conditions where we're going to be building a lot more land use and trying to keep it dense, the congestion is going to worsen and these level of service are going to increase and we need a way to manage that. And our existing travel demand models are not set up to give us good performance measures when we are at these heavily congested conditions. And we have engineers and planners that take the output of the travel demand model and do operational analysis with volumes that far exceed capacity and our simulation models and our operational analysis fail badly because they cannot analyze conditions that are this heavily congested where the demand exceeds capacity by a factor of 1.5, 1.6, I think there's something missing on that slide. Ah, there we go. What we have in a lot of cases is the output of the travel demand model, like I was saying, way above capacity. What we wanted was a way to bring it down and to give us a duration of congestion and spread these excess volumes. What we've seen in the past in some of the studies that were done, when the volumes far exceeded the capacity and the information was ported from a travel demand model, into simulation models and other operational analysis, they didn't, weren't able to handle and didn't know what to do with these excess volumes. So a lot of times they just reduce the demand to make the simulation work, to make the operational analysis perform. Making trips go away just to make the models work, quite frankly, is a poor practice. We had to have a way of preserving these trips and still doing the operational analysis. And what happens in reality is when your demand is that high above the capacity, what happens is you have a mixture of effects. Some people leave a little bit early to try to get home before the freeway gets really bad. Some people tend to work a little bit later and wait it out. Some people take a different route. Some people work from home and do other things. But we see people reacting. And in reality, those high volumes are not pushed through the system. And we needed a way in the engineering analysis world to account for this and make the way we're doing the analysis better match what's happening in the real world and make the output of the models work better with subsequent operational analysis. And this was the thinking and the need for developing the tool and going forward with this study. We also wanted the output of this to, be very, to replicate reality and be based in reality, not just some theoretical model. So what we did was we looked at real world data from ATR and from portal. We got about four years of data from the portal system, four years of data from the ODOT's ATR database. We got some tube counts. We got some other data. And we started looking at what is happening on the freeway system in the real world and what trends are we seeing and how can we use these trends to develop a tool that can help us modify or adjust what's happening out of the travel demand models to get these performance measures and do a better job of estimating con congestion and figuring out how to rank projects. So we basically got our hands on a whole bunch of data and started looking at it and pulling it together and doing the validating and the cleaning. Um, we started out with data from about 650 portal loop locations and other locations. We did some cleaning and validating tossed away some of them that looked like they were hit and miss and not performing well, tossed out some of them where we didn't have the full data set. Um, 
threw away some of the ramps that it looked like people were not driving over the loops right. And we ended up with about 450 places throughout the Portland system with valid data that we used to move forward on the study. The thinking here was, okay, what we want to do is we want to take the two hours of AM, the noon hour, the two hours of PM, and from that, can we get a time of day profile? The model is going to give us estimates on a noon to one, two hours in the PM, two hours in the AM. So basically, our starting point is five hours of the day that are largely known. The two hours of AM is combined, but that's between a 50-50 and a 52-48 spread. They're pretty close, likewise for the PM. So you can basically say, we know it's happening for five hours of the day. Given those five hours, can we say anything about the average daily traffic? From that, can we predict the 24-hour volumes? And then once we have that, can we come up with the other 19 hours and get a time of day profile? If you can't do that, how are you going to figure out which of those hours are above capacity and which of those hours are below capacity? So step one was figuring out, can we come up with a time of day traffic profile given that we only know what's happening in five of the 24 hours? And we're like, okay, how do we do this? And we sat back and said, the area under the curve of the 24-hour profile is ADT. If we can't estimate ADT from these five hours, and if we can't get the area under the curve, we're probably dead in the water. So step, was, step one was, can we estimate ADTs from these five hours? Answer turned out to be yes. And the first time we saw this plot, we actually went back and did a bunch of error checking because we thought we really messed something up. We honestly didn't believe that you could estimate ADT this reliably given only five hours of the day with the other 19 unknown. We went back twice and did error checking. And if you take a look at this, this group down here at the lower end, those are largely your arterials. The upper end are the largely your freeway links with the more congested ones at the top end. And when we did this, we were, our original thinking was that we were going to have to develop one model for the arterials and one model for the freeways. We didn't think that we were going to get the same set of equations, the same set of parameters that would work for both. We seriously doubted that. And we even had doubts about whether we are going to have to do the inbound freeway and the outbound freeway differently. Because you might have AM congestion on the inbound, PM congestion on the outbound. We're thinking, OK. We're going to have to develop multiple models. As it turns out, one equation, one model, actually worked very well for the inbound freeway, the outbound freeway, the arterials for the whole mess. There were some very minor differences between the best fit model for the arterials and the best fit model for the freeways. But the differences were so small that when we looked at it, we said, and when we talked with the client ODOT, we decided it makes sense just to go for a simpler model, combine them all. The differences are so small, they don't matter. And we went for straightforward, easy to use, easy to explain, over 100% technical and academic accuracy on the statistics side. We were building a usable tool rather than wanting to write a white paper for publication. So we went for straightforward and clean. And as you can see, if you developed a model for this and a model for this, yeah, they would lie pretty much in the same line. The differences were very nominal. He's asking where we got the data for the arterials. In the data set that we were using, we had data from portal, data from ATR readers, and we had a bunch of tube counts that were collected by um, the city of Portland and or ODOT for various projects over the last four years. So we had a bunch of tube counts that were collected for various projects, various reasons, and they just grabbed them all and handed us the bunch. So we had whatever they had available for tube counts, and there was a uh, 100 or more locations. 
So these would probably be the tube counts on the arterials, and these up here would be the portal and ATR stations off the freeway. And you can see it's pretty clean, two groups. ADT, average daily traffic. It is the sum of your 24 hourly volumes. It's the expected traffic on a 24 hour day. ATR, automatic traffic recorder. recorder. Thank you. It's a loop or a station that records traffic long term automatically. Um, think side fire radar wavetronics. Think um, the in pavement loops and these types of things. Someone else had a question back there? trial, did you already run a trial um, and your numbers were way out to cause you to say, well, those loops are no good to us, or? No, we did not um, clean the data based on whether they were outlier or not. And I understand your question. You're saying, well, if you had a point here, it would have been an outlier. Did you get rid of it just because it didn't match our, our nice clean line? Yeah. And I've seen people do that. No, we didn't. When we got rid of the ones, we got rid of them because when we looked at them, and when you looked at the time of day profile, there was something really weird going on. They did not match the normal pattern. Or some of them, what we saw was a dead spot in the middle of the day or at the end of the day. If you had, from a comm station going down or a detector going bad, if we had three hours in the middle of the day with zeros, think of a freeway in Portland where you have an honest average daily profile where you've got two or three hours where it's dead, absolutely nothing happening. It was things like this that we filtered out, things that were obviously somehow not representative of, a, representative of a typical day. And I'm talking about a typical day purposefully because if you think of the travel demand modeling world, what the travel demand model is calibrated to, calibrated to, designed to do, and used is it is designed to forecast a typical weekday at some future year under conditions. We're not looking at a low day or a high day. It is seriously a typical day. And each of these data points for the portal data, we took a year's worth of portal data, threw away the holidays and weekends, and looked at the typical weekdays and averaged them. So we'd have a average profile using about 250 some days of data so each of those portal data points is about 250 days of data for a year at one location. And we did that intentionally rather than using the individual days because the model is set up to look at an average day, not your anomalies that happen from day to day, but it's a tool that gives you on a typical weekday an output for that. So we made the input consistent with a typical weekday. So each of these data points, if you counted them up, you probably should have between four and 500 points there. And we seriously did not believe that we got this good a fit. It, it quite frankly, surprised the heck out of us. Well, given that we did this for the daily and it held and worked, the next step is what about the other 19 hours of the day? Given that we know five hours of the day and have a good estimate of the 24 hour total, can we hang a curve in there that goes through your midday, your AM and PM peak, and matches the total of the 24-hour day? So the next step was to run a series of regressions, one regression from midnight to 1 AM, one regression from 1 AM to 2 AM. I'll go on and on, 19 regressions to get the other 19 hours of the day. And how good a fit can you get? Is this reliable, or do you end up with garbage? Oh, I didn't show you this. Guess what? Here's the R output for the 24-hour ADT. And as you can see, we got very highly significant um, parameter estimates. It fit really, really well. Yeah, we got a 0.99 R squared. Let's go ahead. Here is what we got doing the individual 19 hours of the day. And there you say, well, there's a lot more data points there than on the previous plot. Yes, the previous plot had one data point for each location for each year's worth of data. This plot has 19 dots for each location, 
for each year's worth of data because we're not estimating an ADT, we're estimating 19 individual hours. And these points down here are either the arterials or they're like from 2 to 3 a.m., very low volume times on a freeway. Your upper ones are the highly congested ones during the peak period on your busiest segments. And you can see we have more scatter here than we did on the ADT. It's a little trickier to estimate an, each individual hourly than it was to estimate the ADT. Our significance test and our parameters, the level of significance held, it, it was um, actually quite impressive. And when we started looking at the size of these errors and compared it to the errors that are normally associated with travel demand model output, because think of this, we are building a tool that's going to be used on travel demand model output. Take the two hours of AM, PM, the midday, and give us a time of day profile. Our output, even if it's perfect and air free, is no better than the reliability of the travel demand model itself. When we looked at the size of our errors and compared them to the size of the errors that were in within the travel demand model itself, how accurate is the model? Our errors were small in comparison, which made us feel good. And we said, yes, we're not increasing the error term hardly at all. In fact, if you want to get tuck statistics, you actually have to square the error term because it's the variances you should be comparing. Variances are additive, not standard deviations. So you compare the variances out of the travel demand model, square R, standard deviations, get variances, and compare them. And when you do that, our error terms were on the range of one-fourth to one-tenth or less of what was in the travel demand model. So we really weren't exaggerating errors, and we really were not increasing the lack of believability or the confidence that was coming out of the analysis, which was a very nice finding and a very nice thing to be able to say. What we're looking at here is the actual parameters. We had four inputs, the ADT, which we're treating as a known because we'd already estimated, the two hour AM, the one hour noon, and the two hour PM. Those were the four inputs into an equation and what we wanted out of it was an hourly volume for one of the 19 time periods. These are the parameters. And if you look at them, they really make sense. Look at this one, for example, the noon to 1 p.m. You give me the volume, I give it back to you. We had a 100% R squared on that one. You give me a volume, I can give it back to you without introducing additional errors. The p.m., we got almost a 50-50 split. That's no big deal. You should know that. The a.m., you can see it's a 52-48 split. And the other ones, look at the p.m., here, for example, what this is telling us is if the PM peak period is high, you pull the shoulders up. If these two are really high, you want to pull the ones adjacent to it up. You don't want a fast drop. You got a positive sign and fairly large. As you drop away from that, the signs will go negative. And that makes sense. If this is really high and the area under the curve is frozen, something else has to go down. The ones next to it are pushed up as that goes up. The ones out here go down. So the points close to this go up. The ones far away from it go down. Likewise, on the AM. Look at your, your AM peak. If this 7 to 8 and 8 to 9 is high, the points next to it go up. Wait, 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 I'm on the wrong one. The points next to it go up. As you get away from it, they get pushed down. This makes sense if you think of the way curves move and parameters fit and the way models, mathematical models work. It's like, okay, that's nice. The real question is, what does it look like? How close are you to actually being able to estimate the real world 
hourly volumes. We took these equations, fed in the portal data, we added the, we fed in the noon to one hour portal data, we fed in the, added the two hours of the AM peak together, fed it into the equation, add the two hours of the PM peak together, fed into the equation, and we got out an hourly volume. We compared that hourly volume out of our little model to the real world hourly volume from the portal detector, and we plotted it. This is one of the curves. The green is the empirical, empirical real world portal. The red is what our model predicted. And as you can see, the model predicts remarkably close, a remarkably close pattern to the real world. And this just isn't a pretty plot. We saw this over and over and over and over at site after site after site. And we were really amazed and quite surprised that we didn't have to do multiple models. One for inbound freeway where the AM peak was high, one for outbound freeway where the peak was high, um, one for arterials. We developed, in the course of the analysis, we probably developed somewhere between 12 and 20 different models. And at the end of the day, we said, these plots are so similar and the outputs are so close to each other. This level of complexity is unwarranted. And we combined it all down, put all the data sets together, the arterial, the freeways, into one big database, and said, one simple model does a really good job of prediction. Here's a different one where we have an AM peak and quite a bit of spiking. You can see some of the points are off by a ways. Like that right there is a difference of about 100, 100 out of 1,000. That's about a 10% error. That was one of those points that doesn't lie right on the curve. And even with that, if you just sit back and look at the general shape and say, just sit back and give it the laugh test. Does it look reasonable? We said yes. You can draw your own conclusion, but we said yes. This is a reasonable representation of what's happening on that link on an average weekday. The next piece of the puzzle was, remember we talked about spreading? What we've done so far is just estimate the curve. Now what we want to do is figure out how to, if it's above capacity, push it down and spread it out so that we have better, so that we have more reliable inputs for operational analysis and so that we have a better estimate of the duration, because if you're above capacity in the travel demand model, remember we said that that traffic doesn't all get through. It queues up and gets through later, or people leave earlier or stay at work later, and it gets spread out so that you, in the real world, you are not pushing more capacity. Let me say that again. In the real world, you are not pushing more volumes through a bottleneck than the capacity of the bottleneck. It's physically impossible. If you try, things queue up and people just sit in a queue and wait. We had to have something that emulated that and the way people react to congestion. And to do that, we had to look at how these peaks flatten out or spread as they're congested. We looked at a whole bunch of sites that were uncongested and peaked and that were congested and flattened. And we said, as they flatten, how do they tend to flatten? Is it 50-50, half late, half early? Is it two-thirds early, one-third late? How do people react as, they, as things get congested and they peak flatten? Does it all flatten this way? Does it all flatten this way? Does it flatten equally front and back? How do you spread that? And what we ended up with was an iterative solution where we took the middle volume and we spread it according to an algorithm that we developed from how things spread. And once that was done, we grabbed the two next hours, spread them out, the next two hours spread them out until we had it all flattened. The resulting volume set matched the total volume of the starting volume set. We did not create trips, we did not make trips go away. We just took them from the middle hours, moved them out. Took them from the shoulder hours, moved them out more until we had the same area under the curve, but we're not exceeding capacity in any hour. So it was a 
changing the shape of the curve, not changing the area under the curve. The area under the curve is the total volume. We're not making, we're not creating trips, we're not making trips go away. We're just flattening them out the way queuing would as if those trips had to make it through the system. Or, mm -hmm. sorry. If the five to six hour was congested and you wanted to spread to the six to seven and the four to five, the 16 and the 25 are like proportioning ratios. You add them together and you end up with about 40. Mm -hmm. Well, 16 over the 40 go this way, 25 of the 40 go this way. And you, you start from the six to seven and these proportioning factors you used to smoosh them out. Then you grab this one and smoosh them out according to that weighting scheme, and you just keep iteratively smooshing them out. Sorry for the technical term smooshing, no, no, but no. it so, pushes so them out until you have all of the hours at or below capacity. It just keeps moving them out until none of them are above capacity, and then it says, okay, I'm done. Here's your adjusted volumes. And it's a little VBA routine embedded in an Excel spreadsheet. We pass in the volumes, pass in the capacity, and it just loops, returns them, and we paste them back into Excel and move on. But I mean, is that realistic though? Because then aren't you ignoring people's, like, people's need to be somewhere at a specific time? I mean, if somebody wants to leave work at five, it's not really realistic for them to then end up leaving at two or three. It seems we like hear you and we understand that. This was from the portal data. This was developed from real world data, looking at peaking and looking at flattened peaks. And when you look at the flattened peaks and the peaking and the ones in between, this is how they spread in the real world if you're doing just temporal spreading and ignoring spatial spreading and all the other things. We are limited to, we were limited to, let's back up. This was developed to be an add on for a travel demand model. That means what we had to use for inputs was what the model was outputting. We had a two hour AM, a one hour midday, and a two hour PM volume. That was what we were given to work with. And from that, we had to come up with something. That is a pretty limited set of inputs to be doing this. And given that limited set of inputs, there are limitations to what this is, but this is as good as we could get it given that limited input set and given the purpose for which we are building this tool. It was to give us better performance measures out of the travel demand model, which means you're limited to what the travel demand model can produce for existing, for 2025, for 2035 conditions. We started having discussions about, well, this and this and this, and we understand the real world today, but you jump ahead 20 years and do forecast. It's like, okay, what inputs can we grab reliably and incorporate into the process that will help and have it be simple enough to where you can use it cost effectively on projects and hand it out to agencies, ODOT, the city, and others. And we sort of backed ourselves into a corner and said, we get it's not perfect, and there are limitations, but it gets it's a long way from two hours, one hour, two hours, to what we really need. It gets us 80 to 90% of the way there, and it's really easy to implement. It's a really easy to use tool. But yeah, it, you're, it's not perfect and it doesn't do everything. And there are effects in the real world that this doesn't capture. So um, speaking of effects, of course, you can't capture them all. But it seems like a big one might be um, people changing their route depending on traffic reports or their traffic apps. I know I won't get on I-84 if it shows all red on my Google traffic. We, we talked about that. And the travel demand model in the auto assignment algorithm already does that. But it does not do enough of that. You still end up with on critical bottleneck links where you've got multiple freeways coming together. And this section is the only realistic game in town. You still end up with volume to capacity ratios that still exceed one. And this is a byproduct of the current travel demand modeling technology. And it's something we have to live with. And you're right. We talked about doing spatial spreading. 
and more of it. But given the data we had, given the budget we had, and everything else, we had to leave that for another day and another project. And there are models out there that have been developed. Um, the dynamic traffic assignment, your mesoscopic DTA models, do a much better job of handling things like that. That is, that is an inherent, inherent problem of the four-step travel demand model, what you're talking about. We did not fix that. We didn't make it worse, but we didn't fix it either. Did you do it? Uh, did you apply the same principles to the AM peak spreading, or was there not? You didn't take that into account. I don't understand your question. So sorry, it, were those numbers it, that spreading? Did that? Did you do that in the for our AM peak? Um, was there a change? No, there's. We're just showing the PM factors here. There's a separate set of AM factors. Oh, okay. And were they similar to? Did you, like, were people starting earlier in the day? The AM factors actually. Um, were more heavily loaded on the front end. People don't like being late for work. They were more, these factors in the a, on the, the front end of the peak were heavier than the back end of the peak. And we said, like you're shaking your head, you're going, okay, that makes sense. So is there any reason you limit your analysis to just one common day for sort of all days in the year or um, so? Well, in I'm the thinking portal, maybe on Fridays it might be a little different, like excluding weekends. It might be a little different, but again, this was built for a tool on the travel demand model. The Metro travel demand model output oh. is for a typical weekday. They don't have a typical Monday through Thursday and a second model for a typical Friday. So we built our tool given that that's what the model does. It gives you a typical weekday, a non-holiday work day. And I think when they grab the volumes that they calibrate the model against, they even throw away the entire week of Thanksgiving, the entire week of, thank of Christmas. And they are really looking for just a middle of the run, typical work day. Work day is not a technical term, but you get what I mean when I say that. It's not the day before or after July 4th. But, but it's not a data limitation, right? Because we no. have observations for We have Friday observations. For and if we had a stochastic model that we were applying this to, we could have done that. But since we had a, a static model that gave us a typical day, we matched our data and the tool for those conditions so that we would be apples to apples when we did the analysis and the comparisons and when the tool was applied so that we were applying it consistent with all the other assumptions and constraints of the travel demand model itself. So ODOT was your client? Yes. Um, what? Give us an example of what they would do with this tool now that they have it. Good question. Wait about five minutes, okay. and if I still haven't answered it, ask it again. This is one of the outputs of the spreading factors. Um, one of your questions was AM. You can see the AM got front-loaded more than hind-loaded on this, and this was a, a typical plot from one of the locations. Let's move ahead. Before we talk about the results, one of the things that we wanted to do was ODOT wanted a critical review of the tool because they were going to be giving it out to other agencies to use. So they had a we had a critical review team, a review team, and they basically said, yeah, it's reasonable, it's easy, easy to see, easy to explain, it works. Not going to read it all. The two things or the few things they said that were caveats or warnings was, be careful when and how you use this. The travel demand model does not do queuing well. If you have two freeways coming in in a bottleneck, it will tell you that this bottleneck is congested. But the links upstream of the bottleneck in a travel demand model look like they're uncongested, when in reality you could have big queues that spill back. The limit, one of the limitations of the travel demand model is it doesn't do that well. Well, our application didn't make that work and didn't fix it. The 
shortcomings or the limitations of the travel demand model are still there. If the model is not well calibrated, you feed the output of a model that's not well calibrated into this, it doesn't fix them. The other thing they said that overall it's not as robust as the newer activity-based models, not as robust as DTA. We've already had a question on that. You're right. It doesn't fix the limitations and the shortcomings of the travel demand model. It uses a travel demand model and from that gives us a better estimate, but it doesn't fix anything that's inherently or structurally a limitation of the model itself. We're just using the output. And they just wanted to make sure that the critical review team wanted to make sure that those points were well known and that if you really needed something that did queuing and handled these shortcomings, the model did a better job, you should maybe switch to a different analysis technique and not depend slow, solely on the output of the travel demand model. You should maybe use something else in addition to it. The output. We basically dumped the, now that we had the volumes and the volume to capacity ratios on all the links in the system, you can count them up and you can plot them in bar charts or um, bandwidth plots, color coded, whatever. And here's one of them, looking at the what we call hours of congestion. How many hours of the day are these links congested? You can color code them, bandwidth plot them, and look at them and compare them for different scenarios. If we add a lane of freeway here, if we extend max, how do the with and the without for 2035 compare? Where have we cleaned up congestion? Where is it still bad? And you can use it for all the what if scenarios you're analyzing in your planning and engineering studies. It gives you one other performance measure to help you figure out is the proposed improvement doing a good job or not. And that's what this is all about. We're providing meaningful information for good decision making. It's a usable performance measure that helps in that process. How we used it, it gives us a good um, measure of duration of congestion. It gives us a new look on bottlenecks and understanding of bottlenecks. It helps us identify and assess locations of operational improvements. And we can now compare Portland to other regions as far as duration of congestion. There are national report cards out there that have this as one of their performance measures. This gives us this information for the Portland area. Let's talk about these. Duration of measure, duration of congestion. You can plot it and see for future year scenarios where the system is not meeting some prescribed threshold. And we keep talking about V over C ratio. We could use volume to capacity ratio of 1.0 or you could say 0.8 or 0.7. You can pick your threshold and say are the volumes above it. So you're not frozen to an LOSF and one threshold. Here's an example of on the GIS plot showing the areas of extreme congestion and it's for a 2035 scenario and we have two volume sets. One is pre-spatial spreading and one is after spatial spreading. You can plot or use either one. Both volume sets are there. It's up to you to determine do I want to use, do I trust the spatial spreading and want to use those volumes or do I just want to use the volumes before the spatial spreading has been done. It's up to the project manager and the agency to determine which one they consider to be more meaningful. We have some links that are in 2035 extremely congested, basically congested for the entire day. 20 years from now you've got some critical bottlenecks where if the forecasts are in the right range you're not going to have a few hours in the a.m. a few hours of the p.m. It's going to be a mess the entire day. And in L.A. and San Francisco and other urban areas, they're already seeing this today where you have segments of the system that are congested from 6 a.m. largely through about 7 p.m. Um, the approaches to the Bay Bridge in San Francisco are one of them. 
the second point was you get um, new dimensions to understanding key regional bottlenecks. It really points them out. It shows you where your really, really, really bad bottlenecks are in your areas of extreme congestion. It's just not AM and PM one hour level of service. It really highlights where you're going to have major congestion problems down the road. It gives us better information for input into subsequent analysis. Remember we said that the operational analysis and the simulation models and the DTA models do not behave well if you feed them volumes that are way above capacity. It gives you a way to bring these down to realistic inputs that those models can handle without just throwing away trips and saying, oh, we pushed the volumes down because they were unrealistic. Believe it or not, we've heard people say that on, on some studies. Oh, we had to push them down. The trips couldn't get through. What do you do with them? We just pushed them down. No, no, no. You, it's not a good practice to just say, oh, we can't accommodate those volumes. Let's throw them away. This gives us an alternative. Last of the four points we talked about, it lets you compare to national scorecards. And you do have some links that are going to, in 2035, rival the levels of congestion we're seeing in some very, in other areas today. In Chicago, New York, and LA, we could probably add San Francisco and a bunch of other cities to that, we are seeing 10 plus hours of congestion on some critical links. 15, 20 years down the road, on the do nothing scenarios, you're seeing 12, 14, 15 hours of congestion on certain links in Portland. And this highlights it and gives you information on it and gives you comparison points. Once this is all said and done, we basically grabbed it, shoved it into an Excel spreadsheet, and the Excel spreadsheet grabbed the model volumes, dumped them into the spreadsheet, ran it through these calculations, and gave you a set of volumes that you could then load back in the model, load in GIS plot, do whatever you wanted with them. We implemented it in Excel largely because every agency staff person we knew already had Excel on their computer. They didn't have to buy specialized software to do this. And if we'd have put it in GIS or something else, they'd have had to know how to do it. If you go ask your average engineer and average planner, are you good at GIS? Some yes, some no. Are you good at Excel or proficient Excel? 90 plus percent of them say yes. We're housing it in an environment, Excel, that they were already comfortable using and already could use well. The easier we made this for them, the more likely they were to use it, be comfortable with it, and be able to focus on interpreting the output and doing their job rather than learning some new tool. We really wanted to make it easy for them to use. So we put it in Excel, which was something they already were comfortable with and knew how to use. Sure. I want to know, don't the population have an uh, impact? Is, is there a way this congestion issue is going to be solved because, you know, the population keeps growing? And so I just don't understand that part. The travel demand model itself will increase trips and demand for travel as population grows. Population and social economic data are one of the inputs to the travel demand model. And if you increase the population or the number of jobs in the region, the travel demand model will convert that into trips, link origins to destinations, do route choice, and forecast how the given group of people in the input data set will travel given a input transportation system and an input set of pricing and other constraints. But that is already one of the inputs in the travel demand modeling um, arena. We went way over time. I'm not stopping at 1243, but this is the last slide. We also looked at this methodology and said, is it Portland only, or is this, could this be applied to other regions? And in Sacramento, they've got what they call the SACMET model. It outputs a three-hour AM, a three-hour PM, a midday, seven hours, and an 11-hour night. 
given those four volume sets, can you get reasonable hourly estimates? You don't have to do ADT because you add those four together and you have ADT. But given that, can you get reasonable estimates or is this a fluke? It works in Portland only. We did it for, we applied the same methodology. You had to rerun the regression analysis using different inputs, a 3 hour AM, a 3 hour PM, a 7 hour midday and 11 hour night and rerun it. But having done it once, it was pretty straightforward and here are some sample plots of what we got out of that. It will work on other systems reasonably well or at least about as well we suspect. We tried it on one other. We've only done it on two, this um, Portland and Sacramento, but we would expect you'd get similar type results from other models, given that you had at least five hours as an input. You start going down to a one hour AM and a one hour PM and nothing else. And some of our models have just that. All the output is a one hour AM and one hour PM. I don't know how well it would do if your inputs were that limited. But if you have reasonable inputs, reasonable outputs from the travel demand model, which are inputs to our little hours of congestion model, you can expect pretty good results. This was well received and we considered the project a success. I'm tired of talking. So how would your, um, the tools that you built incorporate or um, integrate into when cities are able to gather this data in real time? Like I know IBM is working with cities in South America, I wanna say Rio to gather uh, traffic data in real time. So mm -hmm. how would your models integrate into a system like that? I don't think it would. Um, and I say that because you're gathering data in real time. You're getting, but you're not building a predictive model. You're just looking at what's happening today. And in the real world, if you have a bottleneck, once it's at capacity, things queue up and things stop going through. You don't have a forecasted demand that exceeds that capacity, you're looking at real world events and real world traffic. You do not have the limitations of a four step travel demand model and its limitations that you're trying to overcome. But with real world data, all you have is what's happening now and what has happened. You don't have the predictive capabilities. This was largely built to improve the performance measures out of the predicted scenarios for a travel demand model. So it's kind of an apples and oranges um, set of needs. I just want to, last, to just the last one. I just wanted to ask, um, uh, did, when you offered this data, to, gave this data and analysis to ODOT, did you also offer proposals to those, any of those routes that the, that where the congestion was, uh, where you said that the congestion was the worst, did you offer any analysis or, or what proposals on what could be done to fix those areas or? Those were questions for subsequent studies. Our focus was on building a tool that would help them do that analysis. But in this effort, we did not actually perform those analysis. We were just building the tool so that those analysis could be performed. This was all about building an application, building a tool it, so that other engineers and other planners could get better performance measures when they did those studies. Uh, with your peak spreading methodology, it seems like if the uh, demand were high enough over the capacity, you wouldn't be able to spread it out enough if you only had like six hours, seven hours to spread it out to. So what did you do with the extra trips? We kept, kept track of them. If we could not spread it, and this was a real interesting conversation we had with ODOT. What if we can't get the PM peak between 2 and 8 p.m.? Do we want to go to 1 and 9? At some point it becomes a joke because if you want to go home from work at 5, you're not going to wait till 11 p.m. to go. You're going to find another option. So if it's really, really, really congested and you can't get it spread, and we talked about how big this window should be. Should it be five hours, six hours, seven hours? In the AM, five hours, six hours, seven hours? We have an AM bucket and a PM bucket. If it's so congested we can't 
all these hours get full and we still have excess volumes, then we pulled them off. We did not get conservation of vehicles, but we did not throw them away. We tracked them in an individual variable, which is traffic that could not be accommodated. And it's up to the engineer to figure out, do I believe this? Does this make sense? But at some point, we said, no, we're not going to spread it anymore. And we have a, I don't know, excess demand bucket that we threw them in and tracked them. And in the existing conditions, there are very few links where we had that problem. But near 2035, especially with the do-nothing scenario, no improvements on the transportation system, we did find that there were in the range of 50 to 100 or more links where we had that problem, individual segments on freeways. Yeah, that, that did happen in some cases. Yes, looking at the Portland map and the arterial and freeways, the first you said that you were thinking there were two, there were, you would have two models. We thought we'd have to develop multiple models. Uh, so my question is, what would cause you actually to develop those multiple models? Because it seems that inherently it has similarity for two areas. You're right. But going into this, we didn't know that. We didn't know what we would find. We wrote a scope of work saying we would try to develop something that would give you more meaningful information. And then we collected the data, ran the analysis, and saw the output. We had no idea what those plots would look like when we were writing the scope and dreaming all this up. And without, with the luxury of hindsight, we can look at that. But when we were at the beginning ground looking at this, our guess was the arterials in the freeways would be different enough so we might have to use different parameters in the equation to estimate them. We really didn't believe that you could get a one-size-fits-all that would work on minor arterials, major arterials, downtown arterials, suburb arterials, suburb freeway, rural freeway, downtown freeway. We, I'd have lost paychecks on that bet that you could get one model that worked well on all those facilities under all those varying levels of congestion. I just didn't think it would come out that way. It fooled me. All right. Well, before we thank our speaker, I wanted to remind you that next week, at the same time and same place, uh, Alex Bettinardi from the Oregon Department of Transportation will be speaking on transportation analysis informing transportation policy at, at ODOT. So uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. And so let's thank uh, Mike for his great presentation. <laughs>